So I'm going to just jump in and ask the first question um, to the representatives on the panel. Um, so Cami Griffiths, who's the, the founder and director of the Community Technology Network, um, often says that many companies are working to spread the internet um, connectivity to the underserved. And thanks to Cami Blackstone for being here with us too. Um, so they're doing work to spread this connectivity, but access to technology is only a partial solution because it's like merely, what do you say, Cami? Uh, it's like giving a car to someone who doesn't know how to drive. Um, what are your companies doing to address this question and to meaningful, cl meaningfully close the digital divide, especially among isolated seniors and disabled people and low-income families? And we could just start with, um, actually, maybe Scott. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, just thank you, Supervisor Mar, for all of the work you've done to champion, um, you know, the work around the digital divide and digital inclusion. Thanks to all of you all here and, and uh, to the folks who worked to put this together. We're really, um, Comcast is really proud to participate. So to answer your question, you know, our digital divide program, Internet Essentials, was created about six years ago. Um, and at the time, it focused on families with students eligible for free and reduced launch. And it was a, a comprehensive program to provide uh, low-cost internet, an internet-ready computer at an affordable cost, and then training. And so, um, you know, that's been our, our marquee effort around digital inclusion nationwide, and we've seen great success with that. But what we've done here in San Francisco, because there's such a unique um, ecosystem and, and social infrastructure around advocacy for seniors and and disabled folks is that in concert with uh, Mayor Lee's administration and the Department of Aging and Adult Services, SF Connected, um, uh, and some of the nonprofits you mentioned, CLC, CTN, and, and Self Help, we uh, expanded our program to low income seniors 62 and older, and uh, also provided significant funding about $150,000 in, in funding to go towards. Um, really ramping up and, and um, doing more training throughout the SF Connected uh, computer training labs throughout the city. Part of that was um, an idea that we borrowed from your report in 2015, but um, the way we worked, it was just, um, it, it, it's been um, a, just a transformational experience for us to partner with, um, you know, the, the government agencies with the CBOs and the, and the private partners, including our employees who volunteer their time, to really go out, talk about the importance of being connected, um, overcoming those obstacles of, of, you know, barriers and cost of service, um, barriers and, and costs associated with devices, but really tackling that third piece, which is, um, you know, this, this whole bucket of, of training, of fear, of lack of perceived need and um, we've been able to in chorus with a lot of people in this room work together to um, have a significant impact with seniors in San Francisco. Actually, I should have said it would be good if each of the um, panelists could talk a little bit about themselves briefly and and your company as well. Scott do you want to just? Yeah well I'm so uh, I'm Scott Adams director of government external affairs for Comcast in San Francisco and the West Bay um, I handled the uh, uh, implementation of our broadband adoption program here in San Francisco, but also have been the lead implementer in California and now for the West Division. So a lot of my work has been um, to work with my company and members of the community and the state at a broad level to deploy our program um, to get people connected. Thank you, and thanks for your support of the Richmond District organizations. And, and Rudy, kind of a new addition to the Richmond District as well from Monkey Brains. Yes, uh, thank you, Eric, for um, organizing this panel and uh, recognizing that access is an uh, important part of the digital inclusion. And, uh, and for Comcast, AT&T, WebPass, and Monkey Brains, we're all happy to be here representing our companies and uh, uh, discussing how we can make internet um, more inclusive in the city of San Francisco for small businesses and residents. And um, to address your question about uh, um, how are we uh, doing, the, your question was how are we helping adoption of the internet we provide? What, we're doing two things basically. We're, uh, we're working on a project in Hunters Point right now where we're wiring up uh, about 200 units, the Hunters Point East-West apartments. And what we're doing is we're um, 
installing a hardline internet connection so people will have a gigabit ethernet jack in their units or some units will only have 100 megs based on the wiring but our goal is to um, get rid of the uh, um, the, the divide of some people only getting a Wi-Fi handoff. Some, some, sometimes that's uh, proposed as a solution. We've done a bunch of projects in the Tenderloin with um, ECS and uh, the Episcopal Community Services and uh, getting other low-income housing uh, wired up. And we do uh, wireless handoffs, and there's sort of there's still a barrier there. So what we're doing is we're, we're with this um, apartment complex, we're going to give people an Ethernet handoff so they'll have more autonomy to... Uh, um, configure the internet how they want to and access it in the way that everyone else does and also to have faster speeds. We're also working with uh, CTN, one of our, um, one of the Monkey Brains employees, Preston, who's here, is uh, on the CTN board and um, we're going to work with them on getting education uh, to the, uh, to the people in the Hunters Point East West uh, housing projects so they can uh, use the internet connection. So we're, we're figuring out how to partner with other organizations, basically. Great. And now more about WebPass. So my name's Charles Barr. I'm the founder of WebPass. Um, and we provide internet service in seven cities. We start, we're founded here in San Francisco, and we reach about 10% of the San Francisco households. So if you look around in San Francisco, roughly one out of 10 people can sign up for WebPass tomorrow. Um, we were recently acquired by Alphabet. You probably know them as Google. Um, so we kind of split the responsibilities between those two organizations. WebPass as an organization, our goal and our charter is to go out and to make sure that the internet is available for everyone. So we are a building organization, basically the construction arm to go out and make sure that everyone has access to that. Our parent does a ton of digital inclusion work for us. Part of the transaction for WebPass being acquired by Alphabet, we volunteered to do a thousand training sessions with low nonprofits, low income individuals all across California, so in San Francisco and the entire state. Um, there is a division of folks at Alphabet, their whole job is to make sure that we respond to organizations like this, that we provide the tools and resources available to, to bridge this digital gap. And it works really well, so it's been a good partnership to date. Thanks, Charles. And Cami Blackstone. Hi, I'm Cami Blackstone, Director of External Affairs for San Francisco for AT&T. Uh, and AT&T, um, like all of these companies, feels a certain responsibility to make sure that uh, we include everyone in this digital revolution. Um, some of the things that we've been doing is we have, um, like uh, Comcast has their Internet Essentials, AT&T has Access, which uh, provides free equipment, free installation, uh, of the equipment for internet service to people who qualify. And then that service is $10 a month. We've also introduced um, our Trek program, which provides a tablet that uh, once you sign up for it, it's about a dollar a day for them to have a, a tablet. And then we also do our Digital U um, program, which is we partner with different nonprofits. It's particularly, we do it mostly with seniors, but we can do it with just about any nonprofit. We've worked closely with Self Help for the Elderly, um, with 30th Street Senior Center, and other senior focused organizations on uh, doing tablet training, internet safety, social responsibility on the internet, and that kind of thing. So, those are kind of some of our programs that we have, but we also do a lot of contributions that fund um, larger outreach programs. We just uh, gave a $50,000 investment grant to Hack the Hood uh, that helps um, kids develop different, uh, give them some sort of internet training, but also teaches them different ways that they can participate. Thank you. Um, the next question is, I think over the past maybe 10 years in San Francisco, there's been a lot of dialogue about um, the city government and municipalities um, really playing a, more of a role in coordinating and um, working with the private sector to have um, different types of municipal networks, whether it's a hybrid one, public-private, or municipal uh, networks like Chattanooga, Tennessee, or hybrid ones like in Austin. Um, we've had studies from the Tom Almiano era to now looking at the challenges of this, and I think um, only now with the San Franciscans for um, um, Municipal Fiber Coalition are we kind of raising these issues, but I think we need input from um, the private sector, big and small. Um, what do you see as challenges for accomplishing uh, a municipal network in 
in San Francisco and um, and what can your companies do to build that kind of partnership so that um, with our coalition and others so that we might be able to achieve this in the future. Um, and anyone can start. It doesn't have to be Scott. Yeah. Um, I, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Rudy Rucker. I'm the founder of Monkey Brains, and we're a local ISP in San Francisco. But I'd love to jump in on this one. Um, as, a, uh, as a small business, we uh, are very uh, flexible, and we'd love to work with the city on any municipal project. I think it, m it might be a little bit harder for Comcast and AT&T because it, it could be a direct competition. But we, we see it as an opportunity to bridge the digital divide. There are some neighborhoods that we, um, where the internet connections are very slow and there are, are only the options of Comcast and AT&T and they have older infrastructure there. They're, they're, your companies are constantly upgrading, but there are still areas where the infrastructure is uh, much older and we're able to shoot a wireless signal in there and do high bandwidth solutions for people. But if the city provided a ring of fiber around uh, through core neighborhoods, and allowed uh, access to various companies, Monkey Brains and others, to access that and uh, uh, partner um, uh, partner with the city. We'd be able to uh, increase our connect, uh, throughput and connectivity to various neighborhoods, especially um, other areas with uh, older infrastructure. The digital divide, in our minds, isn't um, only the uh, it's there's an, it, there's a, a cost issue for paying for the service. There's the um, and then there's also the there's a divide of can you even get the internet a fast connection in your house maybe you can only get one or two megabits per second and that's uh regardless of income level there's a divide there and people are excluded and uh we're we're always looking for ways to solve that problem i could talk about this one all day i mean <laughs> <laughs> this is my bread and butter and i very much appreciate the opportunity to talk about it so municipal networks are great and there has to be a way for us to find uh a partnership that works together there. But one of the things I always find interesting about municipal networks is the, the challenges that WebPass faces building a network are the same challenges that a city is going to face building a network, or it's going to be the same challenges that AT&T faces building a network. It's the actual building that takes time. It's the permits. It's the structure sharing. It's the poll access. It's all those things that people assume that the city will have no trouble with. But it will have all the same barriers that we have. So you have to address that environment first before you can execute upon a municipal network. And my apologies for calling um, AT&T and Comcast elephants um, <laughs> along with Google, but um, I didn't hear go that. ahead. We never forget, no. In, um, oh, oh, well, one, and to, uh, to uh, reiterate what Charles is saying, if there were legislation passed to allow uh, micro-trenching or other um, a newer uh, ways of deploying fiber in the city. It could be uh, it'd be easier for WebPass, Monkey Brains, Comcast, AT and T for all of us to deploy fiber. Yeah, Cam, I, Cam here, Scott. I, I'll say, yeah, the city does set up a lot of barriers to entry for fiber deployment. Um, I know that AT and T is facing that big time, and we're trying to work through that as well. Um, the public-private partnership or a municipal broadband is sounds awesome um, and maybe it has been awesome in a couple of places but I think um, some of the pitfalls that are out there are real and I think that um, I know that at at and and I'm sure with everyone else we're looking forward to having a conversation with the city about a possible public-private partnership where we can use you know Everyone up here were the experts on how, how this is done. And so I think um, being able to utilize some of uh, our expertise and, and uh, our infrastructure would be probably the best move. Scott? Yeah. Well, so I'll, I think I'll answer your question. Um, I guess first it's about the, the partnership piece, but break it down in terms of deployment of infrastructure and then um, adoption uh, to the maximum benefit for uh, the community. And I would say, you know, you folks touched on it um, pretty well, all of you, that the, the challenges with our business is, is just uh, physics and finances, and that um, it's costly to build a network, it's costly to um, maintain and upkeep it. Um, you know, we're absolutely committed to um, providing the best possible service to um, our customers across the nation and particularly, you know, in the communities we serve and it's, and we just know it's, it's costly. There's, um, the regulatory regime. I think it's the same hurdles that we face the the city would face. And, um, you know, so I, I, I would, you know, 
say that point, but we're always willing to, to partner with the city, and I think we've shown that um, in any way that we possibly can to bring more people into the digital world that I would cite, you know, again, our uh, partnership with the city with the, the uh, senior pilot. I, I think that there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity now we've expanded our Internet Essentials program to HUD in Section 8 housing. So working with the RAD partners, working with the Housing Authority to get, um, you know, Internet service out to folks. And it's not just Internet service. It's the, it's the um, you know, low-cost Internet service, the free Wi-Fi, the affordable equipment, the access to training, um, and, and, you know, in language and really going to them and utilizing some of the techniques that we've developed in partnership with the community, like um, on-site registration events and facilitated adoption processes and, and things like that. So, um, you know, two challenges, both are equally important, and, um, you know, it's uh, why we're all here. Yeah, and there's a there's a there's an urge amongst all four of the panelists to build networks in San Francisco. Yes, <laughs> it's not like we don't want to do it. We want to do it, and that's our business, and we strive to do it every day. But the challenges are real. So the first question really hit on the point. You can give somebody a car, but if they don't know how to drive, we build the car. But there's still what's missing is the how do you drive, mm -hmm. and the city will face those same challenges. I mean, if you asked every panelist, they would have a they would have a an issue that would have an example of an obstacle, like AT&T, as an example, brought UVerse to San Francisco last, right, in the whole city, not because they didn't want to, because they couldn't get street furniture in, because there was problems with that, because all these regulatory issues slowed them down. Well, if the city goes and builds a municipal fiber network, they're going to need the same things that AT&T is going to need to build that fiber network. I mean, the technology is the same. So there has to be an understanding that we want to build, and we will build, and we are building. Uh, and I would add to that that um, other cities right here in the Bay Area make it possible. It's just San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, well, Ludi. I, I, I just wanted to add, uh, that's a key point, that, that we are building and yes. that, that we have been building and that we are here. And I, I think our company has a tremendous amount of, of pride for the amount of, um, you know, uh, uh, funds and physical infrastructure we've been back to invested here. And, um, you know, we're committed to this community and, and we'll continue to, um, you know, improve our network, expand that, increase speeds as we've done almost, you know, 17 times over the last, you know, X amount of years to make sure that we address the needs of, of our customers here. So, so go ahead, Rudy, last comment. Okay, yeah, so, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, building the infrastructure, um, uh, we, we've recently sec secured about half a million dollars in funding through several grants through the CAF, and we're going to be able to provide high-speed internet to 1% of the 150,000 people that were mentioned that were underserved in the city. So we'll be able to turn up a, roughly 1,500 units. And um, we're hoping... Uh, we're, we're, That's in Bayview? It's, it, that's all over. It's, uh, it's uh, actually 13 different... or 13 or 14 different buildings? 15 different buildings. And um, uh, it's not just the Hunters Point projects, but other ones as well. Uh, senior housing, low income. And uh, um, during the course of uh, getting this funding, we've had some meetings with the, uh, uh, the San Francisco Department of Housing, housing Corporation, SFDHC. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to um, figure out how to get a wireless or a, a fiber connection from the city through Brian Roberts at DT or so, someone else at DT will be able to partner with us so that we'll be able to use um, existing city infrastructure for this project. There is um, unlit fiber in the streets that the, the city has that we would love to use for digital inclusion. And then there's um, right now we can't uh, there's no policy in place where we can uh, purchase fiber or lease fiber from the city. And we also can't uh, purchase fiber from Comcast and, or AT&T really, or WebPass as far as I know, anywhere in the city. So we're building all of our in infrastructure through wireless links. There's a wireless radios now that will do five gigabits per second over the air. So that's um, one thing that's making uh, um, the fiber less necessary in our minds. We're, we're doing, we're figuring out how to get around that through wireless links. and. Um, we're still hoping to build fiber, but it's a, right now we just do a high-end fiber link to a campus and then do, um, we do a wireless link to a campus and then do fiber within that campus. So we don't have to be on city properly. The 
again, because of the regulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I should say that um, I know I've worked closely with Scott and Comcast and Cami and AT&T, and your direct involvement in communities is something that's extremely well acknowledged by many of the community-based groups, and I've seen it kind of in my neighborhood, but also throughout the city. Um, the last question before we go to um, questions and answers from the, from the public, um, I know from the Community Living Campaign to the Community Technology Network that we've been having lots of dialogues about small nonprofits from self-help for the elderly and immigrant and low-income community organizations, um, the so-called um, public housing or housing projects, uh, residents and others, and there are tremendous challenges of um, connectedness, but also building capacity and educating people about the use of technology. Um, and within our um, San Franciscans for Municipal Fiber Coalition, a lot of these issues are bubbling up and very common among many organizations that assist low-income residents and communities. Um, and culturally sensitive trainings and support systems that have been needed from the days of CompuMentor to TechSoup to new entities. I think it's, it's always been there. What are your companies doing to help build up that capacity, especially in low-income neighborhoods, with whether it's faith-based groups, community organizations, and residents of public housing, for example? Well, so I'll answer that question. Um, you know, our, our national blueprint for Internet Essentials um, began as you create a partnership with the, the main, you know, governmental agency that, um, that is the best advocate for the population that you're working with. So, you know, school districts, then you partner with the CBOs that are providing services with the constituents. Um, that, that you intend to impact, and then you create an echo chamber. Um, so you provide, um, you know, funding for training. You provide materials in language. We provide our Internet Essentials materials in 14 different languages. And so that was our model. And, and as we saw with the senior pilot, um, you know, partnering with DOS made great sense. Partnering with SF Connected because that created the the citywide infrastructure to give. Um, a network that people, that low-income seniors, uh, you know, in some cases in their dwellings could go down and receive training, you know, where it's close to them. Um, in many cases, from a volunteer that speaks their, their, their primary language. And so um, that's how we go about approaching these new demographics. And so the way we help build capacity is first, you identify the right partners and then you know, you seed them with some, um, you know, uh, a fair amount of funding to, to support their efforts to um, educate folks about the importance of, of being connected to help facilitate adoption, but really connect them to training. And so I think some of the really interesting and unique things we did were around um, going to the on-site registration events and, and going to places like Eastern Park Apartments or Rosa Parks or Valencia Gardens and the Mission and um, bringing a, 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 this group of, of Comcast employee ambassadors and you know community-based organization volunteers and SF Connected staff and and we would have um, folks in four different languages so you know English, Spanish, Chinese, Russian um, and to to really communicate to people the value proposition of being connected, utilizing a program like Internet Essentials. Um, but doing it in a way that's sensitive to, to their needs. Um, and, you know, as we transition, not away from the senior pilot, but more towards the HUD and Section 8 space, we've pulled in um, new partners this year. So um, Chinatown Community Development Center, Mission Housing Development Corporation, Felton Family Institute, um, and uh, uh, Bayview Senior Services. And, and that's going to continue to be the approach that we take to get people connected to address capacity, to address uh, specific needs that are sensitive to certain demographics, be it their language or their technological um, needs, and move forward that way. And I know it's much harder, thank you, it's much harder for smaller um, ISPs to um, have multilingual outreach, lots of staff and others, but I'm wondering if um, Charles or Rudy have any um, 
remarks about what you do to help build up that capacity in low-income communities? Well, historically, WebPass did very little. I mean, historically, our, our job was to just go and get as many customers as we could. But post-acquisition, we're focused very intently on it. So we have a whole group that goes out, makes offers to, to community, reaches out to the, to the city to make sure that, they can, that we can participate in these matters. So it's really been a change for us in the past nine, 10 months to, to try and reach out and serve those communities, whereas before we didn't. Um, we have uh, several staff members that are fluent in Spanish, and um, we just recently hired two new employees from uh, META, the Mission Economic Development Agency, and they both speak Spanish very well. And uh, we're, um, uh, our base is more in the mission area, so we've, we're, we recognize that we need to have Spanish speaking on our support staff and new service team. And, uh, and one of our staff members uh, is translating um, the, our uh, documents into uh, Mandarin at home, so, or Cantonese, I'm not sure which one he's doing. <laughs> But uh, uh, we're we're aware of the language barrier issues, and um, our, we're primarily a word of mouth company, so uh, we don't do a lot of advertising. Once people find out about us in a community, it spreads, and we'll get more people in an area interested in our service. And we're hoping to break in more into Chinatown and uh, and get more customers and people served over there. Thank you, and Cami. Well, like I said, we uh, focus a lot on our digital U, where we work with, partner with different organizations, trying to get people to understand how to use technology. Um, we also partner with Community Technology Network on, on um, funding some of their efforts. We've worked with, um, well, I mentioned Self-Help for the Elderly, uh, but a number of different uh, nonprofits throughout um, the city and the greater Bay Area. Um, we did work with uh, Mission Economic Development Center as well, or agency as well, um, letting them know about the access program, trying to get as many um, students who are who qualify access to the internet as possible. So we're continuing that, and we also offer in language. We have our materials. I think it's about 12 uh, languages, not 14. Um, but we do try and be as um, culturally competent as possible to let everyone know about what we offer and what they can take advantage of. Thank you. And now um, let's open this up for questions or comments from the public. And I think we're a small enough group that we don't need microphones. So if you could just speak loudly and hopefully the panelists can hear you. Questions or comments? They tried to spoon some kind of similar project about internet um, uh, broadband municipal project were partnering with Google and Earthlink, but it did go nowhere. So private public industry could be sometimes uh, it's not an easy straightforward path, and I wish we could learn from that lesson and put the lesson in the context of our San Francisco Municipal Broadband Project. Uh, the, the second point, uh, so it's maybe for the city, the second point for this project is we all know, if we think about Google, that's a pretty innovative company, and I don't need to comment on that. They Google, with the Google Fiber, was a very interesting project that started two, three years ago that were trying to bring one gigabit um, fiber-based internet access. Is, it is stalled. It's going nowhere for many legitimate reasons to just confirm how hard it is from a regulatory standpoint, from an architectural standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint. So one thing that I wanted to uh, invite uh, um, WebPass and, um, and the other gentlemen is that maybe we should also look at innovation in the Wi-Fi and in the first mile, Wi-Fi mesh, Wi-Fi gig, improve the quality of service protocol that is not anymore that bad like used to be, instead of looking stubbornly how to bring a fiber to the home. So let's focus, let's use all the fiber on the metro there, in the underground, in metropolitan stuff, in the muni station, muni train, and so we have a lot of fibers, and let's focus on Wi-Fi innovation, and that probably could solve. Third point, we should launch a software-based community engineer in San Francisco, 
using technology like software defined network, using software tools giving to the community of San Francisco the ability to create firewall policy, to establish which one has to go first, the underserved community, the migration, the immigrant community. We could build a community network using a software-based approach, going to the community college and hire, um, very using open source technology, our smart kits and try to build a network on from the layer three and the layer two and the layer one. Could you state your name, sir? Uh, my name is Sergio. Okay. Um, let me just step back and thank you. say thank you for the great question. Um, there is a panel, a community panel of experts from Susan Crawford, from Harvard to others that are looking at the experience from 10 years ago um, to other cities as well and different models. And we're hoping that that uh, community panel of experts with people from Stanford and SF State and many of the institutions in the Bay Area as well to come up with um, different recommendations and options. But let me just ask if anyone from the panel wants to address that great question. Well, uh, WebPass was purchased by uh, uh, Google, as you all know, and it completely validated our all the work Charles and I have been doing for the past decade. And so I'll let Charles take this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First time, Sergio, that's a great question. And the way you broke it down was 100% correct, right? So there were a lot of lessons learned from that experiment 10 years ago, and they've basically been forgotten because we have a new generation of people trying to do the same thing. We can't let that happen. And that's a whole other topic. The second point is spot on, right? Wi-Fi improvement is how you referred to it as. I would refer to it as point to multi-point non-line of sight technology. You need to have point to multi-point non-line of sight technology to really blanket a city. But when you get that, you're gonna run smack into regulatory issues. Because point to multi-point non-line of sight technology, you would refer to as cellular. So that changes the whole game about how you deploy a network. But you have to have that. And my new parent is fantastic with technology. And we are very, focused on finding that technology and refining it. We have lots of irons in the fire all over the place trying to make that work. And when it does work, it'll come a lot faster. Um, and then the third point is about software-defined networking or using community, using community assets to, to bring a fiber network out. 100% correct, but will take a lot of coordination. I mean, then you're talking about how structure works inside the city, who owns what, what you can get into, what you can't, who owns this. And what would be great is if they would simplify that whole process. Of the, of the, of the four panelists on the, on the stage, only one, AT&T, has structure that we can share. Comcast has structure that we can't share. The city has structure that we can't share. And getting into those agreements takes two and a half, three years. Right? It takes a long, long time. So that's the, that is the path that WebPass is going. We are going straight down that path, point to multi-point, non-line side technology, to bring service to single family homes, expansion of the fiber, fiber footprint as quick as we can. Others? I mean, I would say that AT&T, you know, like, like he was saying, I mean, we, we work to try and make things work for everyone. We're trying to partner with the city. We are open to conversations to see how we can be a part of this municipal broadband effort. I think, um, it's going to require a lot of, of different things to make all of this happen between, um, I don't, they need to make some policy changes, probably at the city level, incentivize some of the you know private investment um, and that sort of thing. But we are totally open to working with um, the city and anyone else to try and create a network that's available to everyone. Rudy Scott. Um, well, I would say just uh, in general, in terms of the industry, you know, it it uh, that. The technology changes so rapidly. I mean, I've been with Comcast for a relatively short time, but I always hear the story of, of you know, how Comcast started as a as a as a cable, you know, company that had a, a one-way 11-channel system and and that was you know very limited. And through a lot of that, um, you know, some of that basic infrastructure with a whole lot of investment and technological changes on the hardware and on the software, we've been able to provide the kind of services that we do. Um, and we're going to continue to, to innovate and, and try to, um, you know, address the needs of the population. So that's our commitment. I think right now, um, 
there's there's uh, you know a wireline connection to the home provides um, you know a pretty solid and consistent service level and you know we've invested not only here in the city but across our footprint um, a great deal of um, you know um, time money effort to make sure that happens so we're looking and in the near future really um, excited about some of the developments that are coming with speed increases and um, you know what that's going to mean not only for folks here in San Francisco but across our national footprint. Rudy? Um, I agree that uh, uh, wireless for the last mile is a, is a quick and fast way to deploy it but as the city continues to rip up the streets to redo um, the, the sewage and water throughout the city and, and to redo PG&E uh, uh, gas lines, that's an opportunity that where the city should be putting conduit in place for uh, uh, in installing their own fiber so that they can eventually lease it to other companies or build that municipal network. Yeah. So once the streets open, the piece of plastic tube is pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that I missed that I would address, and your point was really valid, is that um, whatever all of us do, it should be um, done in a very democratic way, in a way that um, treats you know all constituencies the same. So um, you know it, it makes a great deal of sense to to place as much priority um, you know in those low-income areas that are going to benefit from this technology as um, you know some of the other more affluent neighborhoods. I think we might have time, Mariko, for about maybe two questions if we kind of keep it moving. Other, other questions? Uh, that, actually, is there, um, okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Okay, you know, you talk about um, the adding the fiber and everything to the network. I live in Hayes Valley. I'm on the board of directors for the Hayes Valley Neighborhood Association. Um, we battle AT&T all the time. Now, it's not me, it's because uh, I live in an apartment, but there's a lot of people in the neighborhood that don't want the AT&T boxes there, the cellular boxes. And right now, for the next year, the entire length of Hayes Street is, is going to be dug up, and new pipes are being put in right there. Uh, hopefully, maybe they thought ahead and added that fiber on that. But there's a real problem. Uh, we're not someplace, we're not a low-income neighborhood at all, even though we do have uh, some housing developments in the neighborhood. But the thing is, there are people who don't want 18 t boxes and other boxes in there in front of their homes. And so they've been battling it all the time. And as I said, it's not necessarily something that I am uh, opposed to at all. I live in an apartment building and, and so forth, but there's an awful lot of battle right there and if you talk about the, the regu uh, regulations and so forth, you also have to got to talk about the community that might be battling you at the same time. So we got to figure out a way to, to, to do this and not tear up trees and put in AT&T boxes or whatever boxes are in there and for the neighborhood so they can uh, survive. So let me just ask if um, Cami or anyone wants to respond. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for the question, and it's uh, timely. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we talked about the U-verse boxes, which is what you were talking about, um, that were big. And um, there was legislation passed in 2014 that had some regulations around what AT&T would need to do to deploy any more boxes. Um, Technically, legally, we're allowed to do that because it is in the public right-of-way. Uh, we want to work with San Francisco and with the community groups, and we have. Um, the, new, the newer technology with the one gig service and the fiber is a much smaller box. And so we are hopeful that um, through some pending legislation at the board right now that we'll be able to um, work with communities, work with the supervisors to find locations that are appropriate, um, replace the bigger boxes with the smaller, much smaller boxes, and um, reskin some of the other ones so that we're able to deploy the one gig service and the fiber that everyone's been waiting for, but not create a larger footprint of those boxes that nobody's likes. And if I can add on that, um, first up, I love Hayes Valley. It's a great neighborhood. Uh, secondly, the network is a physical thing, right? It is a physical thing. You're going to see it in some way, shape, form, or fashion. It is our responsibility as your service providers to make sure that that 
that is as minimal as it can be and that we're not tearing up streets and that we're doing this in as least invasive a way as possible at times of the day that don't bother you, right? And that is a very strong mandate from San Francisco and that comes through loud and clear in all the regulation. And we acknowledge that and want to behave that way. But at the same time, we as a community have to recognize that if one person wants to stand up and scream and say this is terrible, we have to put that in the context of serving the greater community. And what happens when you're building your network is you just go away from those areas, right? So if I'm trying to go into Hayes Valley and I'm running up against a community organization or somebody who's, who is disgruntled with it, I, I go to another neighborhood. I still try and do it, but it's delayed. And the majority of people want network connectivity. The majority of people want their phones to work. They want their computers to work. They want this stuff. So I think we just have to look at it through the proper lens and we can get through that. Other comments? Then let's have... It's like a bus stop. You're going to have to have a bus stop in every neighborhood that takes up the right of way and uh, you're going to have to have some, some equipment. Some of it can be, the city could pass some legislation to require new um, development, new buildings to include a small uh, easement, easement in, in the corner of a, if there's a big blocky building, there could be a panel ac accessible from the street where you just open a door and there's Comcast and AT&T, WebPass and Monkey Brains equipment off the street. That's, it's something the city would have to do. Talk to your supervisor. <laughs> Thank you. So besides uh, city bureaucracy dealing with neighborhood concerns, I think this shows the complexity of a lot of what we're trying to do. Um, last question, anyone? Thank you. Um, I was asking if you have somebody here enrolling for low-cost internet essentials or access. Um, so we will have someone here at the expo, but if you would like information about um, that and some assistance, I'd be glad to, to work with you on that afterward. Thank you. Any other? Actually, let me just ask um, wrap-up comments really quickly for any of you. And thank you so much for being here, you guys. Go ahead, Scott. We'll start with that. Cami? Okay, thanks. Um, well, first of all, sorry I was late. Um, but second of all, and I th I'm really excited to participate in this. I think that um, you know, Cami uh, has done a great job with this whole Digital Inclusion Week, and it's uh, very exciting. at and is really proud to be involved, and um, I can leave some information here if you had more questions on following up about the Access Program or any other program that at and offers. From my side, just thank you for coming. Thank you for being WebPass customers. I mean, a lot of you are, and I appreciate that very much. That's what makes everything go. Um, and we are very focused on digital inclusion. We'd love to, to assist any way we can. We're excited to be bringing more and more units online, working with uh, various uh, programs through the PUC. And uh, uh, we're, uh, all of us here are providing the, the, the infrastructure and the uh, the educational part is, um, you know, CTN and others will hopefully work on that. Yeah, well, I just on behalf of Comcast, thank you to, to all of you, to the organizers. I'm not sure I heard Win Win's name uh, mentioned uh, much, but I know she's done a, a tremendous amount of work to help put this together. I think the parting words from Comcast would just be that, um, you know, we're honored to be a part of this this collective effort that we've been here in the community for um, a long time and will continue to be, will continue to invest and um, improve our network. But um, on, on issues of digital inclusion and digital divide, we, we want to work with you. We want to hear from you. And um, we're proud to have worked with so many of you in this room and uh, look forward to getting uh, those of you we haven't worked with um, together with you and seeing how we can partner. And as we wait for the community um, organizations panel to come up, I'll just say that um, thanks to Mariko for convening kind of as MC. And as Luis Herrera, our librarian, said, it's going to be a fun, full week with all kinds of interactive stuff, films, um, learning, um, empowering work. But I just wanted to thank Scott, Rudy, Charles, and Cami for joining us this week. Thank you. Thank you.